Yeah, thanks for staying towards the end. And um, as, as you said, uh, yes, Flavian had some late-minute late visa issues, so um, you've got me. Uh, and thanks, everyone, also for the discussion at the poster session. Um, I had lots of questions along the lines of, uh, so what, what do you mean by causal? And uh, so I think that might be a good place to start before I get into the Greek and the experimental design and all that. So um, what I think a lot of the recommended system literature focuses around is we've got users. Imagine we've got a big matrix of users and items. And we can put a one in all the entries when there was a past visit in, in, the, in this pair, uh, and a zero everywhere else. And we can often, often we've got matrices of um, like standard data sets we test these things on, are things like Netflix and Movie Lens. And the literature actually, because there's good data sets, it tracks around these sorts of problems. And we tend to remove some entries and see if we can predict them. And what you're getting here is something like next item prediction or, or something like this. And uh, at Critio, which of course is what we're interested in at Critio, uh, we, uh, we have a lot of data sets from our clients of these, these sort of interest, these product interactions of users. And it's worth noting that we haven't even seen the recommender system yet. This data exists completely independently of the recommender system, yet it's the focus of much of the recommender system literature. So what do I mean by recommendation? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about another matrix. And this time, it's the same dimensions, and it has very similar properties. It's a user item matrix. But this time, we want to put all in, in the entries of the matrix the probability that this recommendation will be successful. By, in, in this case, I'm thinking about we're going to deliver an ad. The ad will contain an item. And does the user click on the item? So this is actually what we're interested in. But there's all this focus on, on this other interesting and re related task, but not the same task. Um, so. Uh, Yes, yeah, so we have, have and we use metrics like MSC and uh, normalized discounted cumulative gain and things like this. We can use things like word to vec or matrix factorization to do this. And sometimes, if we're fancy, we use RNNs or or other things. But really, yeah, we're interested in this. If, if we're going to intervene, how does it work? And this is logging from from the uh, recommender system itself. Um, so okay, now into the Greek. Um, we're going to assume that we've got a stochastic policy that associates to each user i some product j, and, a, and we'll have a probability. It's going to be a stochastic uh, policy, which is uh, the way we usually think about this in practice. Often we de deploy randomized policies. Mostly, and we'll see this very soon, that this is because we want some exploration. It's not necessarily what we think is the best to do right now. Also, we might want to include in this framework that we don't want to make any recommendation at all. Uh, so the problem of interest is for this pair, what kind of reward, which is also stochastic, and this is unknown, and, and the thing we want to get on top of. And we can also compute expectations, because we have the stochasticity of, of the policy being random and the stochasticity of we don't know whether they will engage with our recommendation and click or not. We can also imagine that we, we and this is sort of uh, viewing it from, from a, uh, a, B test, we can imagine that we're running two policies and we're wanting to test which one is going to have the, the uh, average treatment effect or in, um, incremental individual treatment effect uh, when we look at, look at actual user item pairs. And again, we, these are expectations. What we're interested in is we're going to find this policy that, that actually delivers the best actions if we, if we can find it. Um, and we, of course, we obtain the best as the maximum and we get we get uh, the, max, the average treatment effect by summing over the individual treatment effects. As I said, optimal policy, if, if you actually had a perfect estimation of this, this matrix that gave you the, the uh, response uh, to, the, to an intervention, if you had it perfectly estimated, you would simply take the maximum and make that your recommendation in every case. But we ne we've never reached that level of estimation, and so we have some sort of randomization. But it's useful to realize that there's no re reason for that randomization other than to continue the exploration. <coughs> How can we, um, excuse me? <laughs> How can we do this uh, estimation in practice? And what, what's the real workhorse of, um, oh, cheers. <laughs> I'll, I'll just carry on. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not too croaky. Um, the workhorse of, of this sort of counterfactual uh, prediction is, is uh, IPS, 
And it's based on the factor that if you have a new policy, it may make recommendations that you haven't done in the past. So you can't look at the old data and say, uh, did it work well or not? Unlike classification, where you always have that mapping. Uh, so IPS works on the fact that we will, we've got a new policy and an old policy, and we look for places where they uh, serendipitously make us the same recommendation. And then we can look at the consequences of that recommendation. And, um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, cheers. Uh, and, um, and so then we get, we get the consequences that, of that, and we are able to adjust that up or down, depending on the, if the new recommendation uh, policy makes that, that recommendation more or less frequently. There's a couple of really severe problems. This is a really great method, but it has a couple of severe method problems in practice in that uh, often that agreement doesn't happen very often because the action space is huge. And it's particularly bad when the new policy starts making recommendations that the old policy was not making very often at all. Um, OK, I'm brushing ahead here. If, you, if all you cared about was trying to estimate the, action, the, uh, the consequences of actions, then you, you could deploy a randomized policy. That's, a, of course, not what you want your recommender system to do. Uh, you, you want your recommender system to focus on the good actions. So here we're, we, Flavian and Stephen, are proposing a, uh, um, a solution where they're going to use um, performance under, under a uniform distribution, pi rand, and from the existing policy, pi c. Um, and they're going to do this with a cofactorization of these two, two matrices. So we have um, we, two data sets, SC and ST, uh, from each of the samples. I think I'll just move ahead. Um, and we see that each, each item in C is a, is a matrix factorization. I prefer the, the uppercase notation where we say YC is approximately uh, u theta c is, is one of them, and yt is approximately u theta t. But you can break it down into the individual components. So treatment effect, of course, could be a difference between these two. Um, you can turn each of these into, a, into a, just a standard matrix factorization. So here we have a loss. We're being very generic. It could be anything. But uh, if we're talking about clicks, it would be cross-entropy. And we add it on a regularizer. Um, and so here we, have, we can comp compute a joint uh, optimization, which is simply adding, the, adding these two losses together. Uh, we can see that there's a short shared parameter in the user embedding here, too. And we're also regularizing such that the, uh, the, the t and the c are not going to be too far from each other. So it's quite a simple algorithm at the end of the day. Um, so they're benchmarked on. Uh, the two movie lens data sets and in, in the paper in Netflix as well. Uh, but this is not a real data set. This, uh, there's no, actually no data set that satisfies our needs. So we're diverting back to the uh, old favorites of Netflix and movie lens, but we're trying to view them as a causal problem, which is not entirely natural. So there's a little bit of workarounds to do this in that there's, uh, they use important sampling in order to produce a uniform distribution in action space. Uh, one reason uniform is interesting is if you're scoring the system, in fact, you're going to be evaluating at every possible action in order to take the maximum. So you do want your model to perform well over the entire action space. So the uniform is used to, to produce the ST data set, but it's also the validation data set. It has that same shape. I think I just said all of that. Um, because there's two data sets, you can combine them in each. You can, you can either just use ST, SC, or, or, or blend them together. So the, these combinations are interesting for baselines, which do not have a separate space for the two data sets. Um, you can uh, also look at an average, which is simplifying the model on ST into a single vector. Um, so here we're seeing comparisons with a, a variety of algorithms, including basically personalized ranking with the blending and no blending, um, supervised prod vec which is it's sometimes also called logistic PCA. It's a matrix factorization wrapped around a sigmoid. Um, 
You can also do import and sampling to adjust that, which is sometimes advocated, which is the WS, Weighted, weighted Supervised Product Effect. And there's also BanditNet. Um, not all the metrics make sense, so there's some uh, missing elements. And here we see that uh, this cofactorization uh, called COR-Z, in particular PROD-C, is, is giving a good performance over, over all of the other baselines. So it somehow it does seem to be combining this information in a sensible way. Uh, so it's a mean squared error, negative likelihood, log likelihood lift in AUC. Um, we can also see that uh, the core Z is able to utilize the data from, um, as more uh, data in, in the uniform training set becomes available, it's, it, it's able to lift its performance where the other methods seem to be caught and, and not improving. So here we're seeing that, that that ST data set is increasing from 1% to 15% um, with MSE lift and also with negative log likelihood lift. So I think time's up, but I, this is my last slide. So we have introduced null matrix factorization for um, incremental recommendation outcomes. Um, we, we're able to learn user item similarities under the uniform exposure distribution. And um, because it is an extension of matrix factorization algorithms that adds a regularization term on the discrepancy between the product embeddings uh, that fit the training and the counterpart embeddings that fit the uniform exposure distribution. So a relatively simple formulation. Uh, the code is available on GitHub. Thank you. So I, I really appreciate your starting with the point that recommendation isn't just this process of identifying, but the attempt to influence somebody's change in behavior. Uh, but given that, I'm wondering how you could take this further and think about the fact that people change as you present recommendations to them. So if I want you to buy a $700 ticket from Paris to Vancouver, it might not be smart for me to put that on the screen. It might be smart for me to put a $900 ticket from Paris to Vancouver stopping in San Francisco. Have you feel really frustrated at that? And when I then put up the, the cheaper ticket that goes nonstop, you're ready to buy. And it seems that, that a lot of what we talk about is context and sequence. And sometimes the right thing to do is to invest in a recommendation that there's very little chance the person will take to set them up through anchoring, for instance, for the recommendation they will take. Is there some way to extend or use this to recognize that context element of recommendations that might come in sequence? Uh, well, there are, there are sequential models, but I, my main response is I wish we were there yet. Um, modeling, thing, modeling sales is a lot harder than modeling clicks, and I don't, I don't think we've really grappled with that very well yet. Um, we have to deal with incrementality and the fact that we're making multiple interventions over time uh, it, and the rewards come in much slower. So, uh, yeah, when you make a model of, for, for a click, you can do, make lots of reasonably, reasonable simplifying assumptions that once you're in, in this long-term space don't really hold. Um, I don't have a lot to say other than that's really hard. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? Okay, so let's uh, thank the speaker. Thank you. And